Welcome to the Networking Fundamentals module. The objective of this module is to understand the fundamental concepts of data communications, including the OSI, Open Systems Interconnect 7-Layer Model, Network Types, Switches, Routers, LANs, and WANs. If you are not already familiar with these topics, it will help you understand the bigger picture so you can better place cabling solutions within the broader IT infrastructure landscape. In the last 35 years, local area networks or LANs have gone from being an experimental technology to a key business tool used by organizations of all types worldwide. A LAN is a communication system that links computers and other data processing devices together within a small area. It can encompass a work group, department, or a single floor of a multi-store building. Several LANs can be interconnected within a building or campus to extend connectivity. LANs are popular because they allow users to share vital computing resources electronically. They are also increasingly important as a way to link together devices in applications such as building automation and security systems. Resources accessed via the LAN can include servers, printers, mass storage devices, application programs, and most importantly, the information users need to do their work. Prior to development of the LAN, individual computers were isolated and limited in their applications. By linking computers via LANs, their usefulness and productivity have been greatly increased. But a LAN, by its nature, is a local network confined to a fairly small area. To realize the full benefit of computer networking, individual LANs must be linked into an enterprise-wide network. This can then connect all the organization's employees and computing resources, no matter how geographically dispersed they may be. Today's LANs and LAN Internet works are powerful, flexible, and easy to use but they incorporate many sophisticated technologies that must work together flawlessly. For a LAN to really benefit an organization, it must be designed to meet the organization's evolving communications needs. Building a LAN is a process of choosing different pieces and matching them together to meet the user's objectives. Today, local area networking uses a mix of shared access and switched technology. This means that all of the devices attached to the LAN share a single communications medium, usually a twisted pair, fiber optic cable, or wireless connection, or a mix of all three. As we have said, devices commonly attached to LANs include end-user equipment, such as PCs, IP phones, and peripherals, such as printers. Increasingly, LAN-connected devices also include process controllers, security cameras, access controllers, servers, and a multitude of other equipment that forms part of networked systems. Another class of devices linked to the LAN contribute to the functioning of the network. Examples are switches, routers, bridges, and PABXs. The network interface card itself can also be put in this group. To put today's LAN technology into context, we can look at earlier eras of information technology. Current LANs have their roots in the connections between early mainframes and the dumb terminals used to access them. Typically, the mainframe's front-end processor connected to a cluster controller that managed the input and output of a group of terminals. The links were serial connections running SNA, or System Network Architecture Protocols, with SDLC software to manage the data traffic. Cabling was usually coaxial. Often, one big computer served a whole building or several buildings, so the link between the front-end processor and cluster controllers used wide-area network technology. In a world where computers were expensive and labor was relatively cheap, this expensive, slow, inflexible data communications infrastructure was accepted. As many computers spread into departments and PCs reached individual desks, a new kind of network was needed. This only had to serve a small area and didn't need the same kind of front-end processors and cluster controllers as a mainframe. To meet this need, the LAN was developed. Today, the most widely used LAN technology is Ethernet. This strikes a good balance between speed, price, ease of installation, and low support costs. 
We will look at Ethernet in more detail later. The most common applications on LANs are file sharing, email, printer sharing, and web access. In the near future, we can expect to see real-time collaborative working and video applications contributing a much higher proportion of LAN traffic. Before we go into more detail on LAN technology, it's worthwhile briefly defining the other commonly encountered form of network, the WAN or Wide Area Network. As the name implies, this operates over much longer distances and may link with many separate LANs. In LANs, several configurations have been used over the years. Among the earliest and simplest of these is bus topology. Usually, a coaxial cable forms the single bus to which all devices are attached. This topology is rarely used in new LAN installations today because it is relatively difficult to add new users or move existing users from one location to another. It is also difficult to troubleshoot problems on a bus LAN unless it is very small. The most common implementation of this topology was early implementations of Ethernet as IEEE 802.3 using thick and thin coax. In star topology, each device is connected to a central wiring concentrator or hub by an individual length of cable. The cable is connected to a device's NIC at one end and to a port on the hub at the other. Star topology is more robust than the bus. Star network can also be easily linked together by connecting their hubs in a hierarchy as shown in the right-hand diagram. The foundation for all LAN communication is the OSI, or Open System Interconnection 7-Layer Model. This represents the complete communication process, dividing it into seven layers. It defines the communication functions at each of these layers and sets some rules for these functions. The OSI model is constantly referred to in data communications, so it is important to understand the basics. The OSI Open System Interconnection Model defines standards for networks. As an open standard, its objective is to ensure network devices are compatible and interoperability is more easily obtained. The layered approach allows for variation or changes to take place at different layers without the need to redesign the whole stack. Each layer is peer cooperative. In other words, the data link layer information at the transmitting device is relevant only to the data link layer at the receiving device and not any other layers in the stack. As you can see, the model is organized in seven categories called layers. The ones of most interest to us are the lowest three layers. Layer 1, the physical layer, includes mechanical and electrical references for the network media over which information is transmitted. This layer covers cable interfaces, repeaters, and passive hubs. It is further subdivided into two parts. The PMD, physical medium dependent part, this is medium and connection specific. For example, you may have a twisted pair option or the option for a fiber single mode PMD. The PMD places the electrical or light signals onto the medium. The second part of layer one is the PHY physical layer protocol. This provides the bit encoding and synchronization, the encoding technique and interfaces with the data link layer, the Ethernet layer in most instances above. Hubs and repeaters working at this layer allow multiple devices to exist in a single domain, where each device competes to transmit information. Only one device at a time can transmit. If a second tries, it will cause a collision and will have to retry. Layer 2 includes packing data into frames or packets, sequencing the frames, checking data, and physical addressing. It is also subdivided and covers media access control and logical link control. The Ethernet standard is used at Layer 2 level and includes the unique MAC hardware address and the Ethernet frame protocol CSMA slash CD carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. The MAC layer addressing gets you from hardware to hardware within that local area network. Switches work at this layer. Each port on a switch is a single CSMA CD domain, very often with only a single device on it, which means no collisions or delays can occur on that port. 
Layer 3, the network layer, covers logical addressing using routing protocols such as IP, Internet Protocol. Routers and gateways work at this layer, gateways working even further up the stack. The network layer information is encapsulated inside the Ethernet frame. It adds its own IP address information, and unlike the MAC address, which only gets you from device to device within a LAN, IP addressing is used to route the information across a network, which may have multiple hardware devices and protocols en route. The main job of a router is to unwrap the incoming frame, look at the IP address for the packets of information, and route each packet out towards its destination on what could be a very different kind of network, wrapping it back up into an appropriate data link frame for that network. This diagram represents how layers relate to a networked application. At the top layers, the browser handles applications and presentation. In the middle layers, the IP software works with the Ethernet card, and at layer 1, the data is transmitted from the interface and onto the cabling. While the seven-layer OSI model is an abstract theoretical representation of the network, it relates to tangible network components we know very well. For compatibility, these components have to conform to the OSI model. The key components of a network are a network operating system that usually forms part of the computer operating system. This facilitates communication, sharing of resources, and sharing of data. Windows is an example. A network interface card, or NIC, or port that amplifies signals, packages information, and controls access to the network cable. Ethernet cards are an example. A network device, such as a hub, switch, or router, that acts as a center for the network where links from other devices can be connected. Connectivity. This transmission medium can be twisted pair, coax, fiber cabling, or wireless. The physical connection to the network is made by putting a network interface card or NIC inside a device and connecting it to the network cable. Many NICs today come built into the device. Once the physical connection is in place, it is up to the network software to manage communications between devices on the network. In a shared media network, when one device sends a message to another, it uses software to put the message in an envelope. This envelope, called a packet, consists of message data surrounded by a header and trailer that carry special information used by the network software to deliver the packet to the destination device. One of the pieces of information placed in the packet header is the address of the destination device, MAC, Media Access Control Address. The NIC then transmits the packet onto the LAN. The packet is transferred as a stream of data bits represented by changes in electrical signals. As it travels along the shared cable, all of the devices attached to the cable or via repeaters see the packet. As the packet reaches the NIC in each device, the NIC checks the destination MAC address in the packet header to determine if the packet is addressed to it. When the packet reaches the device to which it is addressed, the NIC at that device copies the packet and then takes the data out of the envelope and gives it to the device. Since each individual packet is small, it takes very little time to travel to the ends of the cable where the electrical signal dissipates. So after a packet carrying a message between one pair of devices passes along the cable, another device can transmit a packet. In this way, many devices can share the same LAN medium. Today, switched networks at their simplest split shared networks into smaller domains of fewer users by learning which MAC addresses are on which cable. This improves the performance for those users as there is little or no chance of collisions between the messages they send. The Ethernet standard is defined by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, in a specification commonly known as IEEE 802.3. This includes rules for configuring Ethernet LANs, the type of media that can be used, and how the elements of the network should interact. The Ethernet protocol provides services called for in the physical and data link layers of the OSI reference model. Ethernet networks can be built using three different types of media. TP or twisted pair, coaxial, not common except in certain interface requirements, and fiber optic cables. In addition, wireless can be used. 
By far the most common is use of UTP Unshielded Twisted Pair. It is inexpensive and very easy to install, troubleshoot, and repair. Remember, in Ethernet protocol, each network device contends for access to the shared medium. It is possible for two devices to try sending packets at the same time, resulting in a collision on the LAN. In Ethernet networks, collisions are considered normal events, and the CSMA CD access method is designed to quickly restore the network to normal activity after a collision. A hub is a repeater with multiple ports, most likely nowadays to be UTP. It has no addressing and simply repeats any signal into a port back out on all of the other ports. So it only works at layer 1 of the ISO model signaling onto and off the medium. An important part of designing and installing a LAN is selecting the appropriate medium and topology for the environment. Ethernet networks can be configured in either a star or bus topology and installed using coaxial UTP or fiber cabling. The hub used to be a key element of the LAN. Today, it may be used as a local connection point for a group of user devices. A typical hub has multiple user ports to which devices such as computers, peripherals, and servers are attached. Each port supports a single connection from a network device. LAN technology is evolving. In the early 1980s, LANs were strictly for linking small groups of computers with departments. As workgroup LANs proliferated, they were connected to form Internet works, first using bridges and later with routers. The term Internet working refers to linking individual local area networks together to form a single Internet work. Internet works are sometimes called an enterprise network when they interconnect all of the data networks throughout the entire enterprise. Workgroup LANs on different floors of a building or in separate buildings on a campus can be linked together so that all of the systems at that site can work together. Geographically distant sites can also be tied together in the enterprise-wide Internet work. A key reason for creating Internet works is to share traffic loads between more than one LAN. If the load on a single LAN grows beyond its carrying capacity, users suffer from reduced throughput and become less productive. There are three main types of device used for Internet working, bridges, routers, and switches. Today's networks typically comprise a combination of workgroup and campus hubs, switches, and routers. As networks evolve, we are seeing more sophisticated LAN switches and switching hubs. LANs are being built with stackable workgroup hubs that, in turn, are interconnected by larger modular hubs incorporating LAN switching. Large networks include another layer of consolidation with network center hubs linking workgroup hubs and switches. Routers will continue to be used as gateways to the wide area network linking other buildings and remote sites. For networks to deliver the performance today's users require, their many components must work together to deliver seamless connectivity between all of the users and computing systems throughout the enterprise. During this presentation, we talk about basic 10 megabit per second Ethernet technology. But as LANs have merged into enterprise Internet works, their speed has also increased. 10 megabits per second is now superseded by faster developments such as fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, and 10G Ethernet. These are all derivatives of 10 megabit per second Ethernet. The technology is basically the same. They work in the same way and can all coexist on a suitable network infrastructure. The migration path to these technologies is simple. Ethernet is still Ethernet. Network managers don't have to learn a new technology. Switching hubs replaced conventional LAN hubs. They establish a dedicated link to specific network nodes and can provide selected devices or LAN segments with additional bandwidth. This micro-segmentation is one means of alleviating network congestion and will meet the bandwidth requirements of all but the most demanding power users. Actual network performance depends on the switch configuration, but since switching is handled in hardware, it is always very fast. 
Switches exist in various forms, with more sophisticated, intelligent versions able to monitor and prioritize the data packets they transmit. This is important because it allows real-time applications to operate with low latency they need to give good results. For instance, when a video packet arrives at an intelligent switch, it will be transmitted ahead of email packets that will be stored momentarily before being forwarded. Switching hubs can work with existing cabling and NICs, giving aggregated switch throughput capabilities that can exceed 10 gigabits per second. Some products provide multiple LAN protocol support via different port modules on the switch. Multiple switch server ports are also possible on some products, but not all network software supports this. A simple switch, like its predecessor the bridge, works by learning the MAC addresses attached to each port, so the switch can buffer incoming data from a device, then only transmit it onto the port, domain, that that device is on, thus reducing traffic loads across the LAN enormously. A simple switch works at Layer 2 Data Link Layer. Switches vary in functionality and can have many sophisticated additional features. Switches usually come with network management ability in the form of SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. Switches have become the standard LAN and Internet work device, taking over from bridges, especially for linking building and campus LANs. They are fast, affordable, and costs for implementing and maintaining them are low. Switches can be used to link several separate LANs and provide packet filtering between them. A LAN switch has multiple ports, each of which can support a single end station or an entire Ethernet LAN. With a different LAN connected to each of the switch's ports, it can switch packets between LANs as needed. In effect, it acts like a very fast multiport bridge. As we have seen, packets are filtered by the switch based on their destination address. Switches are used to increase performance on an organization's networks by segmenting large networks into many smaller, less congested LANs, while still providing necessary interconnectivity between them. Switches increase network performance by providing each port with dedicated bandwidth without requiring users to change any existing equipment. They can also support numerous transmissions simultaneously, increasing network capabilities. Today's switching devices can handle relatively large, variable-length LAN packets between different local area networks. As a result of all these advantages, LAN switching has replaced bridges and moved routers into specific areas of the network, such as WAN access. An individual LAN is subject to limits on such things as how far it can extend and how many devices can be connected. There are also limits on how fast data can be transmitted between devices and how much traffic it can support. As we have seen, if a company wants to go beyond those limits to link more devices than that LAN can support, for example, it must install another LAN and connect the two together in an Internet work. If it wants an Internet work to work across two widely separated sites, it will need to use WAN, Wide Area Network Technology, to link its LANs. To do this, it must have a means to connect Ethernet with WAN technologies such as T1, X25, Frame Relay, and Asynchronous Transfer Mode, or ATM. Routers are commonly used Internet working devices, especially in wide area Internet works linking geographically remote sites. They are also often used in building and campus Internet works. They are more complex Internet working devices than bridges and are usually more expensive. Routers communicate with each other and share information that allows them to determine the best route through a complex Internet work that links many LANs. They use network layer protocol information within each packet to route it from one LAN to another. This means that a router must be able to recognize all of the different network layer protocols that may be used on the networks it is linking together. This is where the term multi-protocol router comes from. To clarify how the roles of router and switches relate to each other, we can look at how they fit into the OSI 7-layer model and the TCP IP version of this model. As you can see, the switches only handle the LAN function. 
The router, however, also has functions relating to layer 3, IP, where addressing is handled. Information is then routed between network nodes. The router, with its ability to deal with multiple protocols at the network layer level, can interface between LANs and WANs of many different types. This makes it a valuable component in building corporate networks spanning several sites that may be in different regions or even different continents. It overcomes incompatibilities between LANs and LANs and LANs and WANs, with its potential to handle every protocol from TCP IP to ATM and at different layers from physical to network. This graphic shows the signaling from a WAN to a LAN, in this example frame relay to Ethernet. IP packets are encapsulated inside the frames. Frame relay is used typically on a private leased line service connecting to a WAN frame relay node. At the far end of the frame relay WAN connection there will be a similar exit node to a router and most likely in this case an Ethernet LAN at the other end. At this end in the graphic the frame relay encapsulated IP packet comes into the router using a basic signaling layer. The router will have to have the appropriate frame relay interface option fitted and software. The signaling is received, frame read and checked, frame stripped, and IP packets interrogated by the router. The graphic shows only one route out, but remember there may be many and the router either has a record of the network it is heading towards or it will find out then send the packet out on the appropriate route. As it does, it builds a new data link layer, in this case Ethernet, and the Ethernet layer 1 signaling gets it out onto the medium. Finally, the appropriate Ethernet device with the correct MAC address collects the transmission, takes it up its stack, checking and stripping the Ethernet frame, and passing the IP packet to the network layer. Remember, IP addresses have end-to-end -end network significance, whereas data link addresses get you across the local network. Hubs, switches, and routers can be used together in enterprise networks that serve all levels and parts of the organization. Mainframes in Asia can, for instance, talk to PCs in Europe, and servers in the USA can access mass storage devices in the Middle East. Routing protocols specify how routers communicate with each other to exchange information that allows them to select optimum routes between nodes on a network. Generally, a router will hold information about neighboring devices. The routing protocol shares this information so routers can work with information about the whole network and determine the optimum route to a destination using sophisticated algorithms. Some examples of these are shown on the graphic. RIP, Routing Information Protocol, BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, ISIS, Intermediate System to Intermediate System, IGRP, Interior Gateway Routing Protocol. As we have seen, routing protocols operate at Layer 3, the network level of the OSI model. These are router-to-router -router routing protocols, not to be confused with routed protocols, which are the device-to-device -device information, and the protocol that routes them, for example IP, which we are now going to discuss in some detail. IP is the most common of Layer 3 protocols. IP is a protocol used to deliver data to a specified destination across a packet switch network. It is the common language used by devices on the Internet, and the ability to communicate using IP is embedded in the network operating systems of these devices. Like any protocol, IP enables devices to exchange information, allowing dissimilar devices to participate in a common infrastructure. To understand how a protocol works, consider the use of protocol as it is used to avoid misunderstanding during interaction between people. When cooperating with someone who may not understand what the objective of a task is, it's important to make simple, precise requests and confirm acceptance of each request. For example, I wish to connect to your computer. OK. I wish to send it a file which contains an executable program. OK. I am done sending this file. OK. Now execute the program. OK. 
If any two entities are going to exchange anything, a protocol must be established. IP's near universal acceptance is due to its simplicity and effectiveness. Working within layer 3 of the OSI model without interfering with higher layers, it provides a solid and capable platform for services of many different types. We've talked about Ethernet, which mainly addresses the network connection, and IP, the common language of the Internet. There is a complementary relationship between Ethernet and IP. Devices speak IP to each other by using the Ethernet network connection. In effect, IP sits on top of Ethernet. This diagram shows the relationship between IP and Ethernet in the OSI model. IP is in layer 3, the network layer, above Ethernet in layer 2, the data link layer. This diagram represents how communications protocols are used to send an email. You will notice that each stage in the process corresponds closely to a level in the OSI model. Each stage is equivalent to packaging and addressing physical letters so that it can be transported through a stage in the mailing process. Each level requires a different layer of packaging and a different form of addressing. Here we see how IP fits in with the other protocols used to implement the seven-layer model. IP uses addresses that are equivalent to telephone numbers to reach a host device on an IP network. Each host has its own unique 32-bit address number, four octets, with each octet given a decimal number from 0 to 255. This is generally written in dotted decimal notation, for example, 135.17.37.141, a decimal number for each octet. Sometimes IP addresses can be changed dynamically. Here is a graphic that puts it all together. We can see a corporate LAN at the top with file servers, mainframe, and LAN. We can see remote LANs connected via routers across three different kinds of remote connection. We can see hubs, switches, and routers at various positions in the network. This presentation gave a broad grounding in Datacom's technology and techniques. Here is a summary of the key points that must be remembered. Ethernet is the Layer 2 connection technology of choice for LANs. WANs still have many different connection technologies. IP is the Layer 3 protocol of choice for LANs and increasingly WANs. Routers interconnect LANs and WANs. IP has won the war of ubiquity. It will practically reside on nearly every device. That completes the Networking Fundamentals module. Thank you.